Okay, um, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, welcome to the first panel. Uh, it is my privilege to uh, chair this panel. Um, I have two prominent speakers here, Klaus Offek, um, a prominent uh, political sociologist from Germany, and Daniel Krupa, a Czech philosopher. Um, Klaus Offek will be the main speaker, um, and uh, Daniel Krupa uh, will be a discussant. Uh, I should mention um, that uh, Mr. Krupa told me he will be speaking in Czech, so uh, when he, when he Start a speech. Uh, those of you who don't speak or don't understand Czech may want to um, use uh, headphones. Um, maybe I should start this, uh, this panel by uh, reading uh, what is um, what is written uh, in that uh, short paragraph uh, uh, that, that, that uh, introduces our panel. Uh, something deeply disturbing underlies the current situation: a metamorphosis of the whole relationship between democracy and capitalism. Democratic capitalism has changed in recent years to an extent that has eroded the foundations of which democratic politics, on which democratic politics was built. Under contradictory pressures of global markets and domestic public opinion with the state, institutions and parties in decline, what are the chances of European democracy? I think this defines very well um, the team that uh, uh, definitely is uh, perhaps uh, uh, the most important in, uh, in the contemporary, uh, contemporary world. Uh, democracy, political democracy, um, started uh, just like all uh, products of modernity some 200 years ago and was closely tied with uh, uh, other products of modernity such as the rule of law, um, uh, political ideologies, uh, modern media, um, and uh, also uh, capitalism or markets. And uh, no one doubted for 200 years that uh, uh, markets and uh, markets and uh, democracy were closely tied, that in fact uh, um, the existence of democratic capitalism was a precondition for the existence of political democracy. But uh, in the last uh, few decades we have seen uh, a process which uh, uh, cast doubts on, on this process because uh, uh, the, uh, the forms of, uh, of markets have changed profoundly from uh, concrete owners who uh, follow the very uh, uh, virtues and uh, the logic uh, that we knew in the 19th century changed profoundly towards uh, uh, multinational uh, supranational corporations which are no, not owned anymore by concrete people and uh, the relationship, the close, close, close relationship between the markets and, uh, and uh, democracy uh, has, has changed. Um, and uh, what we have also seen um, uh, changing are uh, the ideologies that uh, um, emerged approximately at the same time as, as all these other products of modernity, liberalism, conservatism, socialism. Uh, they uh, are um, also in crisis and, uh, and uh, some of them uh, do not seem to be uh, as clear and as understandable as they, as they were uh, maybe only 50 years ago. So uh, we have, uh, we have uh, a lot to talk about and this uh, one area of course is uh, uh, something I presume that both speakers will focus on. Uh, the other level of the problem we are talking about is whether democracy can really exist on a, on a um, supranational <coughs> level, whether um, democracy which was born in national states can actually uh, be um, uh, pushed one level up to the level of, uh, of um, uh, multinational cooperation, institutions and so on. So far it doesn't seem so, we are talking about democratic deficit, um, we have heard about uh, the absence of European public space and civil society from the future, and uh, uh, perhaps uh, this is not achievable, but uh, uh, this is why we had this panel, and this is why we have two prominent speakers who hopefully will cast some uh, light on, on uh, these issues. So the first speaker is Klaus Fenn, and uh, I am happy to come here on this panel.
Ladies and gentlemen, I'm uh, honored by the invitation to address this uh, distinguished audience. Uh, I am the speaker who comes from the Eurozone and looks at some of the problems just outlined by our, ch outlined by our chairman um, from the inside uh, of the beast, as it were. I'm particularly honored to be able to address you after the impressive speech we just heard by uh, Peter Pitat, who raised the question, what is the narrative of Europe, the European <coughs> Union? How can we make convincing sense of what we hope will be an ongoing process of European integration? Why is European integration a desirable project worthy of the support of European citizens? To start with, I will present you with a little balance sheet where we have four cumulative answers to the question I just raised and then also have some doubts about the validity and the ability to convince of these answers. The first answer is the finality, the meaning, the sense, the ultimate objective of the European Union is to secure international peace. And after the disastrous, horrible first half of the 20th century, we do have, in fact, 70 years, almost 70 years of international peace in Europe. An unprecedented accomplishment in European history. But there are a number of buts to this partial narrative of Europe. Peace, international peace, is being taken for granted by the present situation, uh, the present uh, generation, whose memories of the first half of the 20th century have largely faded. The problem of having international peace in Europe has often since the 20s been rephrased as how to transform a German Europe <coughs> into a European Germany. And that has been accomplished to an extent after the Second World War under the tutelage of the uh, occupying uh, forces, the victorious forces of World War II, through the establishment of the German-French cooperation. But that is something to be taken for granted uh, today, and it is not an inspiring motive for the future. What the, the peace mission of the European Union has so far failed to do is to guarantee not international peace that is accomplished, but international peace in countries or intra, um, international cohesion in countries that are on the verge of splitting or are, have to show the potential of being uh, split. I'm not talking about Ukraine here, although that may also be a, a consideration, but I'm talking, of course, of uh, the United Kingdom, uh, Ireland, Belgium, and Spain. And also one objection to the narrative could be that um, these accomplishments 
of securing international peace, making international war a virtual impossibility, is not something due to the European integration itself, but it is due to NATO, to which most, if not all, uh, member states of the European Union belong. Let us try a second answer to the question. Namely, Europe has the mission of achieving and increasing a kind of inclusive prosperity, a positive sum prosperity where no one loses and everyone wins, although to different uh, extents. European integration, the market integration, has been driven by this motivation of economic efficiency uh, to achieve what economists call econ economies of scale and an advanced international division of labor. And it has achieved this and much of the wealth to the extent, to the very different extent we enjoy it, is actually due to the uh, economic accomplishment of the European Union. Markets become bigger uh, and uh, economies of scale apply. However, the other side of the balance, as we know, economic growth in Europe and economic prosperity is regionally concentrated and there are growing interregional disparities of wealth and prosperity. Moreover, and contrary to what all official speakers of economic Europe and the common market uh, proclaimed, there is no convergence. To the contrary, there is a marked divergence so that Europe today, in economic geographic terms, is not just something that has a divide in the vertical direction that is between East and West, but much more importantly, increasingly importantly, it is a economic space that is divided between North and South. And so the idea uh, embodied in the so-called European Social Model, ESM, is something, and that means uh, uh, fairly distributed, inclusive prosperity with co-determination and democracy. Right? That um, model is something that uh, uh, has fallen victim partly at least to uh, oblivion and uh, is being replaced by another ESM, the European Stability Mechanism, that is uh, in many respects the opposite. The Euro, as I'm going to argue, has divided Europe because there are Euro winners and Euro losers. There is the Northern Core and the southern and uh, western uh, periphery negatively affected by the crisis. So the idea that Europe is a guarantee for fairly shared prosperity, positive sum prosperity, is largely a non-starter as well as an answer of our question to our question. Then the third uh, a set of arguments in favor of Europe is Europe is the guarantee of the robustness of liberal democracy. What about this? All the member states are, according to their constitutions, and the consensus prevailing among the political elites, largely liberal democracies. However, the European Union itself is far from being a liberal democracy with all the accountability mechanisms and parliamentary control 
and parliamentary initiative and transparency and equality of political rights and public sphere that this would include. I'm going to argue uh, in a moment that uh, the European process of integration has so far accomplished much more in terms of making markets rather than constraining, regulating markets and their distributional outcomes. European, the European Union has been described, rightly to my mind, as a liberalization machine that was unable to contain and constrain the market, as it is the case within national political and social democracies. Let me come to my fourth point in my brief overview of what the, the, the motives are, and that is achieving for the mostly small states of Europe, once they are united into a cohesive uh, union, achieve an international role. A role that could be thought of as a certain counterweight of, uh, to the uh, international role of the United States the other coast of the Atlantic. Uh, it could also be thought of as a civilizing and peacemaking force in its neighborhoods. And again, the balance sheet is not by far from uh, very favorable. Uh, first of all, uh, the, the power of the United States, military power of the United States um, is, is much superior than anything we could ever uh, think of uh, in Europe. Uh, the two uh, UN Security Council members in uh, Europe uh, do their own foreign policy largely and we are far from a common foreign and security policy in spite of all the promises of the Foreign Service and, and so on. Also in Europe, among the European member states are the three largest post-colonial powers with their special relationships to their former colonies, Great Britain, France and Spain. Not even in the neighborhood as uh, we have become painfully aware over the last few days, the power of Europe to make peace is a dominant force, although there are still hopes uh, that it works in the particular case that is on all of our minds. Uh, but uh, speaking from the experience of the revolutionary movements in the MENA region, the Middle East and North Africa uh, region, uh, the uh, balance is uh, sobering and disappointing because the capacity of Europe to mediate peace and democratic process has to be, has turned out to be close to zero in that area. No one takes Europe, the European Union, and their southern neighborhood policy, as it is called, seriously in the region. It is not even known to exist. And um, the feeling of uh, uh, powerlessness and disorientation and disunity that Pavel Seifter referred to is uh, very prominent. So the balance so far is far from inspiring or giving rise to uh, 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 self-congratulatory uh, statements. Europe is deficient on all four of these points, although to a different degree. In sum, it must be concluded that the EU has 
given this balance sheet, has consumed more loyalties of its citizens and support of its citizens than it has been able to generate. As a consequence of all these indicators and observations just summarized, it is fair to state, I think, that the project of European integration, including the European Monetary Union, has lost much of its overall mass support and normative appeal. Even in member states where this support was never great, such as the United Kingdom. That is, of course, not to deny the fact that not just investors and commercial elites, but also university students, as well as arts, media, and professional elites, are fully appreciative of the opportunities integrated to Europe affords to them. As are, of course, business elites who, however, see places outside of Europe at least as attractive and promising for doing business and making profits than the EU member states. What I'm trying to say is just that there is little reason to assume that the appreciation of Europe and its integration on the basis of these four key arguments on the part of elite segments, as just mentioned, will trickle down and eventually become a mass phenomenon inspiring a sense of inclusive solidarity among fellow Europeans comparable to that which can be mobilized within the primary reference entity of the nation and the nation state. The European Union is an established condition of life for most of its citizens, something that only if growing minorities are opposed to on principled grounds, by majorities also due to the multilingual nature of Europe and its media, do not know much about and show little interest in what is going on in other EU countries or at the intransparent level of EU policy making itself. On the other side of the motivational balance sheet, many experience the EU as a mixed, a mixed blessing that exposes them to competition in all kinds of markets, labor, capital, goods and services, and regulates, regulates citizens' lives while remaining cognitively and institutionally remote and inaccessible. What has happened and what can be done in this situation? Europe has made the political economy of democratic capitalism more capitalist and less democratic. The four freedoms have reversed the relationship of fought for over roughly one and a half centuries of state and capital, or state and the markets. We have undergone a movement, a movement, a shift, a change from markets and capital being embedded in nation states and controlled to an extent by political rule to a situation in which states are embedded in the EU-wide markets and constrained by tax competition among states an unresolved construction site for the European Union tax competition and the terms of debt determined by the financial industry. So the relationship between states and markets, in particular <coughs> markets for investment, has been inverted due to the widening of the market beyond the nation states and the failure of the European Union to invent, develop, and apply regulatory mechanisms that can be compared to those 
existence at the level of the, market, uh, of the, the nation states. As one also has put it, it used to be the case when there were capital, mobility, controls and borders of so-called national economies still in place, that states could pick their investors. Now, the situation is that investors can pick their states in a procedure that is uh, sarcastically referred to as regime shopping. Investors invest wherever the best conditions, the best tax condition, the infrastructure condition, the human capital condition, the legal condition, the subsidy conditions uh, are given and they move from European state to state causing huge damages, so-called externalities, to the societies out of which they move or where they do not move in the first place, adding to the divergence of European economic space without the European Union being able to protect their citizens in the ways nation states have been able to, in principle at least, to do so. The economic integration is ahead of the political integration in Europe. And the political integration needs to catch up and create a new balance. And that is the agenda for the future. The Euro has added to the problem. The German Chancellor Angela Merkel has famously stated, if the Euro fails, the European Union is going to fail. But she forgot to add that the Euro itself is a machinery that has the capability of destroying the European Union by dividing Europe in economic and, as a consequence, in political terms. The crisis has uh, four stages, as is well known. Briefly to recapitulate, it started with a banking crisis based upon frivolous investment strategies of major banks who could be uh, uh, confident that the state, their nation states, and later the European Union through the ESM would have no choice but bailing them out. This, however, led to a fiscal crisis where the resources that uh, states out of their budgets, of their sovereign budgets, had to spend on rescuing banks were missing for the task of rebuilding the economies. And the uh, consequence was, of course, due to the bank's second strike capability that the banks could now dictate the terms at which states who had saved them in the first place could uh, be refinanced through uh, debt, which is steeply increasing everywhere. The sovereign debt is uh, steeply increasing, thereby limiting the uh, state budget uh, uh, and limiting the possibility to spend on economic and social uh, affairs. Thirdly, we have the inter institutional crisis that no one really knows at the European level what to do, how to gather the necessary consent, how to organize in a supranational, rather intergovernmental way, uh, what uh, has to be done in terms of overcoming the fiscal crisis and the threatening banking crisis, the next banking crisis, after the ne next bubbles have uh, uh, built up. We do have the uh, embryonic and uh, uh, positive 
you not very reliable banking union now uh, with uh, the implicit hypothesis that nothing serious will happen over the next 10 years after a limited fund of 55 billion euro will be built up by the, the whether this, no one can tell whether this is enough and whether this is efficient, but I'm not going to, uh, into the details. And fourth, we have, of course, the political crisis that the decisions that need to be made uh, at the European Union level on restoring the national economies, particularly in the South. These lack a foundation in legitimating processes, which are absolutely uh, needed. Free every such decision on restoring the losers of the euro gain will have to be a decision about redistribution. And it has already been. But to make the redistribution legitimate is the big puzzle. How can we think of a parliamentary body or a legitimately decision-making body in Europe, apart from governments meeting behind closed doors, that can give their placid or uh, give legitimacy to redistributive, redistributive uh, decisions. In the absence of such uh, legitimating mechanism, the political system at the European level of democratic qualities, it is no wonder that uh, member states, publics, on both sides of the divide, both the losers and the winners, will revolt against European decisions that are not based upon legitimate procedures uh, of uh, decision making. What we have instead is a unilateral by a regime of unilateral austerity, austerity conditionalism, uh, with the famous uh, play on words, which says, we give solidarity in exchange for your budget consolidation. And the terms of exchange are determined unilaterally by us, us meaning largely Berlin. Right? Uh, this is not what uh, generates social peace, neither in the South nor in the North. And democracies can most appropriately, I think, be defined as fair procedures processing conflict. There are huge conflicts within nations and between nations, but we do not have a mechanism that can fairly settle the distribution of conflict with outcomes that in future retrospect can be considered fair or meaningful or uh, just. There is, a, as I said, a unilateral austerity conditionalism with counterproductive, grossly counterproductive outcomes, the famous denominator effect. If uh, the, say, Portuguese government is uh, forced uh, to cut pension payments by 20% in order to obtain subsidies or financial assistance, then, of course, effective demand is going down, the GDP is going down, and the debt-to-GDP ratio, which is the all-important uh, indicator, is going up instead of down. Austerity is counterproductive. That is well known all over the academic and political media, but it is still being done. The member states are, and rightly feel, disempowered by the euro, they are politically expropriated. A body that they have not elected, 
and cannot be voted out of office. The European Council, for instance, determines how much the wage payment, the public sector, the education sector, the health sector has to be shrunk in the, uh, the countries of the periphery. And there is no wonder that this uh, condition is experienced by people in these countries as a case of foreign rule, without any legitimacy. There is this new uh, European divide between the North, comprising Germany, Austria, Netherlands, to an extent Belgium, uh, uh, France, and uh, 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 Finland, and uh, Luxembourg, and France is also a question mark here, versus the famous JIP-6, which is Greece, Italy, Ireland, Portugal, Spain, and Cyprus. And some add JIP-6, meaning Slovenia, but hopefully that, cannot, that, that can be uh, avoided. There's also a political uh, uh, divide. 88% uh, according to surveys in the uh, southern periphery, 88%, between 80 and 88% think that the German role in Europe is uh, too powerful and too one-sided and too unilateral in its uh, decision-making. Um, at the same time, there is no way back from the Euro, from the Eurozone. And again, uh, all experts, as uh, in contrast to populist politicians, agree there is no way back. In the uh, event that uh, the Euro should be dissolved, no less than how many 18 Euro countries having to make, uh, rearrange their for their external value of their renationalized currencies uh, with 17 others, right? Uh, that makes up for 153 new currency relations that have to be determined in one day, right? Uh, I mean, the sheer technical complexity is overwhelming. And it will not happen. Moreover, none of the governments and none of the popular uh, masses in the uh, member countries of the Eurozone wants it to go back. Because, partly because um, that would cut them off from all kinds of uh, subsidies. It would also leave them with uh, debt that they have to service in Europe and with a devalued currency that would, would spell disaster. No one would know what the financial industry would do in response to even talks about some countries or one country leaving. A domino chain of adverse effects is anticipated. There is no way back from the Euro and whoever claims the opposite does so for uh, cheap populist political profit has unfortunately also a um, uh, new party addressing uh, the educated bourgeoisie in Germany uh, tries to do. These countries who have fallen victim to the non-democratic capitalism of the Euro uh, feel uh, the victims of two kinds of injustice. Economic injustice, the losers cannot be blamed uh, for their miserable economic conditions. Uh, I mean, uh, there's a new category in European statistics and the statistical office, and this is NEET, is a T, N E E T. And that means uh, a measure for the proportion of young people aged 15 to 25 who are neither in employment, education or training. And that is 25% of that age group in Spain presently. 
and not much less in other periphery countries. This is an unbearable situation. I mean, a young generation that has no institutional location in the political economy of uh, the countries in question. And uh, so they feel uh, treated unjustly in an extreme extent uh, in the European. Secondly, there is on top of that the sense of political injustice, of foreign rule, uh, of the suspension of national democracy. In two cases, Italy and Greece, prime ministers have been appointed that have never been elected before and qualified because they have been in ranking banking, international banking positions, uh, Monti and Samaras, uh, uh, before they were appointed rather than elected. So it, it's not only the absence of democracy at the European level, it is the destruction of democracy at the uh, national level that people rightly, I think, complain about. My conclusion, a vigorous effort to accelerate EU integration is the only way out. And there comes an entirely different set of motives than the ones that I introduce my talk with. An accelerated EU integration is the indispensable way to correct its own mistakes. And that will require a constitutional and political bootstrapping act that no one, the details and procedures of which no one can anticipate. But I think uh, uh, it is nevertheless an urgent uh, act and I think uh, ideas that have been floated also in the talk by uh, Pita, uh, Pita, uh, that we heard, is the idea that uh, this can only happen through a, what I call a alliance or a capitalization of social movements in civil society. And I would add a capitalization of the loser countries, perhaps under French leadership, uh, to change the policies and the statutory rules of the European Union. This situation that is caused by a mindless over-integration of an economic sort and an equally mindless under-integration of a political sort must be restored and balanced and the European Union must acquire social and economic policy capacities that it is currently lacking and procedures to legitimate such policies. For that we need to politicize Europe and the civil society and supranational coalitions of states having fallen victim, both economically and politically, a supranational capitalization seems to me the only feasible way. Thank you very much. And uh, I will ask Daniel Krupa to make his remarks. Ladies and gentlemen, I am in a situation that is not too easy because I have to react to a substantial contribution which is fortunately ended with a clear conclusion. I am in the position of a reactionary and in this reactionary position I would like to add to these conclusions that uh, strange enough I identify myself with these conclusions. I do think that the European Union in a sense uh, has moved uh, forward in the economic area 
and it has become, in a way, a economic giant, but remains a political dwarf. And it's an imbalance that uh, has to be dealt with and equalized. But first, uh, allow me, and don't take it as uh, too pedantic, a few remarks on how this panel was annotated and concerning the term of democratic capitalism. The term of capitalism is an ideological construct of Karl Marx, and the meaning of it was, so to say, to delegitimize a political area as something derived fr from an economic domain. And in this sense, we cannot uh, talk about uh, democratic capitalism. The term is being used in economy, and it means uh, market economy. And it's uh, restrained to a very practical use of this term. And this panel was to react, uh, in a way, to the external pressures on the European Union, indicated something about global capitalism and its crisis, and put forward also the question, uh, what does it mean for the European Union? We used to mention international trade, about a certain amount international trade, then it may become a market and uh, other principles are at work. In the international area, we almost do not have political integration. We have a network of uh, treaties that regulate the global market. And the European Union is one of the major global players. And it's a meaningless power if we look at it from a political point of view. As me in this panel, I am, the European Union is a mere reactionary. It reacts to what happens in the world. And it tends to react with the moral upper hand towards American efforts to solve global issues and global problems. And Americans, as we know, tend to don't do well in this area. And in this moment, Europeans think that they they are way above the Americans and may criticize them. But uh, if uh, they are not a political player on the global scene, then the only thing they can do is merely criticize. And we discuss about uh, foreign and defense policy in Europe, but it is truly embryonic. Uh, Professor Offen mentioned the fact that Europe used to be a peace project. It has to be said as well that in antique Greece, uh, democracy was born out of war motivations. The democratic procedure in Athens was not based on the state budget as modern democracies do, but uh, dealt with foreign policy. With whom are we going to fight next year? That was the main subject number one, and that was the engine of democracy. In our conditions, we have forgot that uh, the issue of war and peace is the most fundamental issue that is motivating European integration. And here as well, I agree with the professor, but there is still another item we should not forget. And this is the idea of human rights, which was preceding the European Coal and Steel Treaty. And uh, as a supposedly economic pact, it would prevent uh, as well a conflict. It was a tremendous idealism of post-war politicians. They started to deal with the issue of human rights as a first in the European Convention on Human Rights, thanks to which ordinary citizens could really claim its rights after exhausting all domestic means. And this 
foundation of the European project remains uh, forgotten and maybe uh, overrun by what is called capitalism as it as if capitalism was playing a dominant role. But uh, we find also the means of uh, legitimization because ordinary people do not understand what is happening politically in Europe. A low turnout in the European elections that we have seen in our country, but uh, it is even better in our country than in some other countries. It in indicates that people do not quite understand what is happening in Europe what is in fact the game, the political game that is being played in Europe. And domestic politicians, when they mention Europe, they would uh, put on the back of Europe its their own faults and uh, deficiencies. These bloody bureaucrats from Brussels are forcing us to fulfill the commitments that uh, we have uh, made our own. And this is the horror against which the Eurosceptics are fighting. When in 1919 we were thinking about the path towards the unifying Europe, at that time it was not called the Union, there was a, a big conference took place in Prague or organized by President Mitterrand. And uh, it, was, it was supposed to offer, if not our participation, in Europe, a, a form of association. It was interesting, but it was uh, interesting in two ways, because the institutions are ununderstandable, not only for citizens, but also for politicians. And this is still existing, unfortunately. What is missing and what is underestimated by political integration is the symbolic level. At the time, I thought about whether the, a president should not be elected. And ever since, I am thinking about how a European president should be elected. And when Mr. Van Rompuy was put into his function, I was ashamed of the procedure when my president is being appointed in such a shameful way. And the same goes about European foreign policy, because it was put into the hands of not very, of, into hands that are not very able. If I can imagine what Tony Blair could do with the position of the European foreign minister, then Europe could become a political player, at least symbolically. I'm not uh, indicating any necessary steps that should take place, but even so, the discussion for those who are dealing with election systems invent a way how in such a diverse uh, situation to elect a president, to elect him politically and not on a national basis. I think this is a task that is true, a true challenge, but back to our subject. The Czech Republic has distanced itself, so to say, from the integration process, from uh, entering into the Eurozone. It has postponed it so long, it became difficult. And the present government that has set a goal to have the Euro from the mouth of some of the ministers, I have heard that it won't happen before uh, 2000. 20, but it will be even after 2020, so it means, uh, in fact, uh, way beyond the horizon we can imagine, unless the situation changes. But uh, it's evident that the new political representation tries to get rid of the negative attitude that has prevailed towards the European Union and the Eurozone in our country, because it understands that it is more advantageous to be present at the table when uh, discussing the issues of the Eurozone rather than being on the table. Discussing global pressures, pressures of global capitalism that we cannot say if it is democratic or undemocratic, maybe it doesn't have a meaning for it. 
what it means for integration. Well, it's competition above all, tough competition in which we are. After 1990, in our streets, small shops started to disappear with the foodstuff, and people complained. They have to ride to supermarkets and hypermarkets, and whenever these shops were reopened in almost every street, and Vietnamese citizens are working there, for whom the Czech legal order is not presumably valid because in any way industrial or because they work very late at night and we are all very happy about it because at 10 o'clock at night we can go shopping but I would bet that uh, no uh, labor inspectorate would control what is really taking place in these shops because they supposedly would be all closed and this tremendous uh, resilience and ability to work of these uh, Vietnamese who are there is a tremendous challenge for us because this the fact that they m managed to replace a network that this could be done by anybody who claim who claims to be unemployed in the Czech Republic so this fact indicates that even on a global level we will be exposed to something that is today being called social dumping and the like. So Europe will have to face this pressure, but it will above all be faced by our young generation and it will find itself in a competition for which it is not ready. Ladies and gentlemen, concerning the subject uh, maybe a, a remark based on a memory for Václav Havel. In the times of uh, communism in 1988, Václav Havel was preparing to gather with Rudolf Batek and others the text uh, Democracy for All, a piece of the text uh, was that mentioned that economic plurality is unthinkable without political plurality. And I discussed with him, you know, economic plurality without political plurality. And whether it can be proved, a centrally controlled system cannot generate something like that. And at the time, already, it was known that China has switched to a pluralistic economy, as it was called by Václav Havel, and kept at the same time a totalitarian political structure. It's a question that remains open after all these years. And I would really wish that uh, political plurality would generate Economic plurality would generate uh, political plurality, but I would not wish that it generates uh, the reverse. It seems from uh, uh, radical voices we hear after the economic crisis, let's hope the crisis is over. And we went through the crisis not without losses because it has strengthened the power of radical political movements and parties that are not only anti-European but anti-integration and some of them are even bringing back to life ideologies and doctrines that were long forgotten. And uh, the political problems generate radical streams, but it strengthens also nationalistic streams that do not wish further European integration at a moment when Europe needs very urgently further integration. When we talk about nationalism and whether democracy and pluralism is thinkable only within nation states and as it is being as it was promoted very strongly by the former president and his 
people. And some of them try to theoretically justify that European integration should not move on because a European nation is missing without uh, whom the democracy is not possible. I always think about the idea of a British historian, Christopher Dawson, who in 1932 wrote uh, an, an interesting piece. The evil of nationalism does not reside in its uh, truthfulness towards the tradition of the past or in the protection I'm a bit lost in electronics, says the speaker. The evil of nationalism is n not uh, in the protection of national unity and the right to self-determination. What is evil is that it identifies this national unity with the original unity of the culture contained in it. And this is a matter that is supranational. And the original foundation of our culture is not the nation state, but the European unity. And it is true that this unity until today has not found a political expression. It may never find it. But in spite of that, it's a true community and not an intellectual abstract. And only through the participation in this community different nations have gained their present shape. And I am mentioning this not to go against Petr Pidat, but that the meetings of intellectuals will not be solved. No, our problem will not be solved at these meetings of intellectual, intellectual dealing with European, the spiritual and cultural unity of Europe. But I am mentioning this because I think that uh, further European integration requires to renew this common conscience of a common cultural unity that was more original than the unity of nations. As uh, the fact that the Czechs consider themselves as, European, as, as a European nation, they say that they have in, in them the original European values that unite us. And I apologize for getting away from pressing economic matters in the area of uh, history and philosophy, but maybe it was also my task. Thank you for your attention. Okay, let me, let me thank Daniel Krupa for, for his remarks. Um, uh, I was told that because we started later, we have uh, 10 more minutes, um, so the break will be only 20 minutes, um, which gives me an opportunity to ask uh, uh, a few questions. Professor Offe um, wrote in, uh, in my opinion, fascinating essay published in the uh, European Law Journal uh, last March uh, about many of the topics he, uh, he raised here. But he also spoke about um, um, something of a vicious, uh, vicious cycle, circle, uh, where um, the current decision-making structures in Europe plus uh, uh, the publics in Europe are not really, uh, at this point, tuned uh, to um, or prepared to handle uh, the, uh, the necessary reforms. And you mentioned uh, that the European Union, uh, after, after actually the victim, uh, or um, Finding um, a, a number of problems in Europe, um, such as the supremacy of markets over over states and so on, you um, actually ended uh, your presentation with uh, some optimistic recommendations to Europe to integrate, sorry, integration and so on. But uh, if you return to this question of of vicious um, uh, circle. Uh, how, how can it be achieved where uh, the public in Europe uh, will resist uh, any, um, any solution to this distributional conflict between the uh, South and, uh, and the North, plus uh, uh, the fact that the uh, decision-making mechanisms, procedures in Europe are really not uh, uh, at this point, uh, uh, 
let's say, good enough to, to solve this uh, problem. Well, I agree this is a very uh, good and very relevant question, and uh, as I tried to find out, uh, it is hard to, uh, uh, to have a clear answer to that. It is a political process, it is in flux, uh, and uh, the At the European level, something could be done. And people like uh, Commissioner uh, Laszlo Andor is uh, one of the protagonists uh, of such a proposal that also finds a lot of support in partial constituencies of European societies. For instance, to uh, create a system where unemployment insurance in, uh, uh, is um, the financing of unemployment insurance is merged um, so that uh, uh, all employees in Europe, regardless of the national situation of unemployment that prevails in the particular countries, would contribute the same contribution to the a Europeanized unemployment fund. That is an idea that is uh, popular in some quarters, uh, particularly the Southern Trade uh, Unions, and uh, surprisingly beyond that. So this could be a partial institutional arrangement that would enormously increase the appeal uh, and directly attention of mass constituency to what Europe can do. The fact that they do it shows that they are able to do something. Uh, a similar uh, move uh, of even greater proportions uh, would be uh, a proposal that is widely uh, uh, advocated by uh, all kinds of uh, economic policy experts from all kinds of political backgrounds. We need euro bonds. So as to uh, alleviate the debt burden uh, of uh, uh, peripheral um, uh, sovereign debtors, the governments, right? and uh, uh, allow them to spend parts of the tax revenues on economically useful and meaningful projects rather than on subsidizing banks through a debt service. Uh, and there are a number of uh, such uh, policy proposals which, if adopted and if sufficient pressure is generated to make the Commission propose it to the Parliament and the Council, uh, then uh, the, the image of Europe that prevails in the mass constituency could significantly change. Uh, if I may, I had one my favorite, uh, and uh, Commissioner uh, Andor tells me that it's going too far because it's a political no chance. But you know what the Gini uh, uh, coefficient is? The Gini coefficient is uh, a good measure for income inequality, which is increasing everywhere, most of all in Germany. Uh, income inequality in Europe. So, so uh, the higher the uh, uh, indicator is, the more inequality, uh, income inequality uh, there is. There are other measures, but the proposal is that uh, uh, there is a European directive addressed to member states that whenever you have reached a GDP per capita of X, then the Gini coefficient may not exceed Y. Uh, and how you do this? Do it through taxation or do it through uh, uh, poverty relief uh, measures or so, remains the member states' business in the name of subsidiarity. But the overall 
indicator of inequality does not, may not exceed this. We can regulate cleanliness of air. Why not uh, uh, regulate uh, the extent of inequality? These are propositions that are on the table. Many people think about this. And the, uh, the political colorlessness of the commission, which does not consist, as you know, of parties, but of commissioners, and they are, of, uh, they are selected from nations. This political uh, colorlessness can be uh, overcome so that uh, European publics can recognize what the direction of policy making is and who it benefits. And uh, uh, another example is how many harmonize European taxation, corporate taxation, income taxation, so that the uh, lid is put on the dynamics of regime, tax regime shopping, right? moving big fortunes. I mean, 40 billion per year flow from Greece um, into Swiss bank accounts. Right? This is something that uh, uh, is within the authority of European um, the European regime of, of Commission, Council, and Parliament to regulate. Why don't they do it? Once they do it, then a, a shift in attention would occur in the public. See, they can do something. They are not uh, entirely powerless vis-a-vis -vis the markets. And, and that is something. May I add uh, one, one point to uh, what uh, you have uh, said, and I think it's very timely and very interesting and open-ended to think about the nature of competition. So the doctrine is, uh, if you want to be bailed out, so the North says to the South, uh, then you need to practice austerity. Austerity is something that, is, that has made itself bad name, so it's avoided even by, by Chancellor Merkel uh, as uh, a word. The new word is you have to increase your competitiveness. Right? What is competition? Competition is something that the definition of which never may be left to the competitor. Because to get rid of your one way of Getting rid of your competitor who takes away business from you, right, is to cut his throat, right? That it should not be permitted. Competition is only permissible if it is regulated. And the EU has been doing a very good job in regulating competition. But competition has also to do with taxation of the competitors. And that is entirely left so far to the nation states. If the EU could overcome itself and its uh, uh, neoliberal ideologues uh, in the Commission to harmonize taxation, that would be a major act of uh, restoring some level of fairness among competing national economies. And they could go on, but let me, let me stop it. Uh, <coughs> thank you. I will also um, ask Daniel Kropa. Um, I, um, and I'll go to the point that uh, Professor Offer just raised, the uh, competition. Um, because I think that you, um, what you have in mind is that uh, um, we are now competing uh, against uh, economies, which uh, globally, which uh, really do not have to bother with uh, labor law standards, social standards, and, um, and other standards that we, um, we have in the European Union. Uh, what is the answer to, uh, what is the solution? Uh, is it uh, um, what some uh, neoliberals uh, propose, that is to sacrifice some of our social standards and, um, and uh, reduce the social welfare state, or is it, on the contrary, 
uh, to actually force um, economies such as China, India, Brazil to um, gradually adopt uh, kinds of uh, labor law uh, standards and social standards that, that we uh, actually cherish. Well, of course, I would have to submit a global vision, but I do not dare to do so at this moment. Let me just make the following remark concerning the competition. Let us understand what is the core of competition on the market. If we speak about a well-functioning market, there is someone who comes with a project, an idea of how to offer new services, better and cheaper services than the existing ones to many people. And the choice of the great many people is that he becomes the one who gets the profit for this new service. So that is the principle of competition. And then there are the others who do not offer similar services and they find themselves in uncertainty, under pressure, and either they'll offer new services or do something else. So this is the merciless pressure of the market. And at the same time, it is a pressure that is based on some ethics because the principle is to provide services to somebody else first and second. The one providing the services does not appreciate or assesses them themselves, but it is assessed by the others and it determines the position on the market. Of course, there are regulations that can for some discipline to the competition. And under such discipline, those who are not successful are not the complete absolute losers. They can continue existing. They will not be forced out of the market. And those who are successful are not allowed to get a monopoly position. To answer your question, I would say yes, but this is how it works at the global market even today. The example with the Vietnamese shops was given because it shows not the globalization from the point of view of the multinational monopolies. Here, the monopoly in this particular case is the Vietnamese Communist Party and government that sent the people. There are approximately 70,000. There are only 2,000 emigrants from Vietnam in the Czech Republic, but there are 70,000 Vietnamese sent here by the government. So this is unfair competition because it represents social dumping taking place inside of the Czech Republic. So this is unfair competition that the Czech workers are faced with on the Czech market and they have no solution to it. So the first answer to this form of uh, competition, unfair competition, is integration, political integration and international agreements at the global level. There are many similar problems connected to globalization that not even a big country of the EU is able to solve, but it could be solved by the EU as a whole it, it, if it had a functioning political structure. And what I wanted to stress is that there is not much time left because the globalization pressure is faster than European integration in the times of the economic crisis. Well, this could be the beginning of a, a long and somewhat technical uh, discussion. We agree that uh, uh, successful competitors uh, are not only themselves winners, but they also improve services for uh, the clients. Uh, and uh, or they innovate and uh, make new. 
But every competition also creates losers. And the question is what happens to the losers. An example is the call for labor market deregulation, introducing more competition into labor markets by um, uh, uh, by lifting employment guarantees over time. You know, you, a policy that is recommended uh, of deregulation uh, allowing for employers to uh, to hire and fire within days. Right? That, is, that is full competition according to the textbook. However, this is beneficial only if those workers who have been dismissed by one employer find another employer who would uh, employ them at uh, cheaper wages or uh, worse conditions and so on. If there is no other employer, the competition is unfair in that the loser of the competition has no option for economic uh, uh, subsistence. And therefore, an economic policy is called for that creates the demand for the labor power of even the loser that would then be able to be re-employed. Right? In the absence of such an economic policy, competition is bound to be unfair because the loser does not have an opportunity to make a living out of his labor power. And that, I think, is a fairly accurate description of um, uh, situations as they prevail in the south of Italy, in much of Greece, in uh, much of Spain, uh, and so on. And without an economic policy to pay, com uh, compensate for the losers of competition, uh, competition is uh, a fraud. It is something uh, that is ir irresponsible and unfair. Uh, to call for, but the European Union does not or not yet have the capacities to make, to inaugurate such a compensatory economic policy so that losers can become future winners again. Well, unfortunately, we don't have uh, yeah, right. more time yeah, to, yeah, yeah, to yeah, continue right. this uh, yeah. really interesting, fascinating discussion. Uh, uh, let me thank Professor Hoffe and Professor Kropa for their contributions and uh, um, and I was asked to mention that um, uh, we now have a coffee break and should uh, meet here again at um, 5.30. Thank you very much.